Hello, everybody. And I, you know, I have to say, I'm somehow reassured that I am not the only victim of John's energy. I think that that's, that's just great. So uh, 20 years ago uh, was when Martin and I started Tesla. And that, you know, 20 years ago, if you remember, AI didn't work. And it was the last thing on our minds because we were completely focused on just making the car go, which turned out to be harder than we thought. But as it, go, as it turned out, actually, we did need some AI because lithium ion batteries, the way they work is you know when they're fully charged and you know when they're just about empty, but you don't know in between, you're really guessing. And it, you know, as you can imagine from a customer, you know, from a, a driver's experience, only knowing when you have an empty tank and a full tank is not gonna work. So at the time we had really primitive uh, ML models that tried to figure out, well, so where were you in that intermediate, intermediate step on the, on the gas tank, if you will? Uh, and we implemented that even in the very first Roadster. Uh, and it worked, you know, pretty well. And this is not range estimation. You know, that's like how well you've been driving recently. Just figuring out how much charge you have. And that still goes on. And, you know, your laptop is a little bit easier, uh, but it still also is guessing a little bit. All that changed, though, in really in 2011. Um, Sebastian Thrun gave a TED talk, uh, which John, uh, you know, was, was at and I was at uh, down in uh, Southern California. And they showed what Google had been working on with their autonomous driving car. They showed the DARPA challenge, you know, video, which looked great. And it was all very exciting. And then Sebastian says, oh, and by the way, if you don't believe us, you know, we have the car sitting out in the parking lot and we'll take you for a spin or it will take you for a spin is, is better. That was mind blowing. And, you know, you get into the thing and it rips you around that parking garage and you think this is amazing. They've, they're 90% of the way there. It's only going to be another couple of years and we're going to have self-driving cars, you know, everywhere. But as many of you know, you know, in computer science, there are problems that getting to that, you know, 90% uh, place is actually relatively easy in retrospect. And it's that last 10% that just, you know, is killer. So uh, we are now 12 years later or 10, 10, 11 years later, and, you know, we're still trying to get that last 10%. It's certainly when Tesla began to, to work on it as well. And we, you know, this idea of self-driving cars is so compelling, but it still really isn't solved. You know, you can do the sort of geofenced, you know, very constrained area with telepresence operators jumping in when things get confused. But we're really not to that point where, you know, it's as good as a human driver, really, at least in all cases. Now, you know, most human drivers believe that they're better than average, which, you know, is a little bit of a problem, but still we're not really there. And I think it might actually require some kind of advancement in both the perception engines and really the understanding, if you will. And, you know, understanding I know has lots of loaded context in the AI world, but there is definitely something missing in the current model. And I think we're gonna get there, but it, it still might be a ways away. It doesn't mean though that AI isn't super useful in driving. And there are lots of safety things. In fact, the previous speaker mentioned a couple of them, you know, parking assists and blind spot detections and departure warnings and kind of all modern cars do some piece of this. And it's all using computer vision and ML to, to make that work. But how the AIs interact with humans that are driving is still really problematic. Um, about a decade ago, I, I, was, uh, I was at a, a conference where they were showing off the sort of very latest in auto tech. And these were kind of secret projects that various companies were doing. And my favorite one of a large, uh, very large car company that I won't mention the name of, um, they had a project where they were looking for drowsy drivers and they were using AI to, to look at the you know, facial recognition, basically not recognition, but, but looking to see the, the blink frequency and how long the blink was and what the face was looking like. And their UI though, if you began to drowse off, um, this thing would erupt out of the dashboard. It was sort of this gnome and it would say, wake up, wake up. And I mean, like that is the last thing I saw that it's like, that is not gonna work. Like no driver wants to have this gnome popping up from time to time. So, you know, that, that, that ability for the machine and the human to work together while driving is still really not, not well, you know, dialed in. You know, when you're driving along and, uh, you know, it suddenly gets confused, 
you don't if, if you're letting it drive you don't want to just say oh take over <laughs> you know you give you want it to have some kind of graceful degradation in the in the experience so that the driver actually has has some time now um I do use AI in my driving actually all the time, not only for the gas gauges and all these things, but also I like it to read the street limit, or the, uh, the speed signs. And it's a, you know, it's a feature that I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, I know how fast I'm going and, and what the speed limit is. But this ability for the AI to simply do that and report it to the driver and then kind of chime and say, hey, you know, you're going a little too fast. A recent feature that, that Tesla's have, which I like, is when you're at a stoplight and the light turns green, if you don't move right away, it sort of chimes. And not that I would ever be so distracted, you know, that I wasn't looking at the, the stoplight, the traffic light. Um, but actually, it turns out to be kind of handy. And the little chime thing is way better than having a gnome, you know, come up at you. But, you know, I'm not super into having it take over entirely yet. I, I, I love that vision of the future, but we're not quite there yet. ML is also used all over the place in the auto industry, and I'm a VC now, so I see lots of companies. And there was a period where all the VC, all the companies that I was seeing in, in the auto space was around uh, self-driving in some form or another. But now they're actually much more interesting. It's using AI to discover new materials, new electrolytes, uh, new ways of predicting battery chemistry, you know, success, but also even shortening the experimental cycle of batteries. When you're testing batteries, there is a, you know, a physical time that it takes. You have to discharge at a certain rate. You have to then recharge it just to see how many cycles the, the battery, and you have to do hundreds and hundreds of cycles, and that takes actual time. So one of the really neat things is I've seen a bunch of, of models now that try to shrink that by, after the first few times, it estimates what this new chemistry is going to, to succeed. And you can discard those experiments really early. So that, that brings the whole experimentation cycle faster. It makes research you know, quicker. And that's you know, incredibly important because we need to get to a place where we have better batteries, cheaper batteries, and you know, we decarbonize the future. So there's also this idea of, of using AI. Um, well, so in the olden days, <laughs> uh, CPUs didn't used to be very fast. And we had specialty chips, which allowed us to get around that limitation of the CPU. And then the CPUs got really fast and the specialty chips disappeared. Now what's happening is, of course, GPUs then reappeared because we wanted more, you know, wanted more graphics performance, which turned out to be super useful in the AI context. But now we're seeing new startups that it isn't so much a, um, a separate thing, it's actually, the individual silicon components themselves are doing AI calculations. It's a whole different model. And we've seen several different versions of this. And those are very exciting because what that is, is try, all, all these devices are trying to solve is that these models have gotten very, very big and very computationally expensive, um, even while you're running the model, not even not when you're training them. So to move that back into chips, move that out of the cloud, actually, and into the edge, it makes the performance much better. It, it opens up all kinds of new applications. Uh, and, you know, it, it makes it, you know, cheaper and better for everybody. And very exciting. Everything from fish counting and parasite detection, which needs to be done at the edge, um, you know, to something like, like self-driving. And it also gets around, you know, Moore's Law. So the other day I was playing with ChatGPT, you know, you know, no surprise, as everyone was. And I happen to have an old weather station that records weather data on, on an SQL database. And every you know, year or so, I think of some new report I want to generate from, with an SQL command. And I thought, oh, I'll have ChatGPT do that for me. I mean, we've had a lot of rain here in California. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's awesome, but we had a lot of rain. And I wanted to look at the rain a little differently. So I went ahead and I described the database to ChatGPT. And I said, hey, chat. I need a new query to do this thing. And, and it generated this query that looked you know, great, had a whole explanation of how it worked and everything. Um, but I looked at the code and I thought, you know, I don't think that's actually correct. I don't think it's gonna work. I think it's a scope violation. So I you know, copy and paste and sure enough, you know, I get the scope violation. So I you know, tell it, you know, chat, hey, that didn't work. I, I got this error. And it came back and said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, here's the correct code. I had a scope violation. 
I'm like, wow, oh, okay, that's pretty trippy. So I run that and it worked great. So then my next query was a lot more complicated and it has to do with with rain years. In California, the rain year starts, you know, on October 1st, you know, and, and goes to September 30th. So I needed to summarize the years in a little different way than calendar year. And I, I explained that to the chat and it came out with this code. And I thought, oh, that's super concise. That's really, really awesome. And I gave it a try. And, you know, it gave me this nice data. Only the data was wrong. You know, it worked fine, but the summations were wrong. And I was looking at the code and I realized I kind of understood what the mistake was. And it was using a command I was unfamiliar with, you know, but uh, I thought, I, I think I understand it. But instead I just said, hey, you know, the code worked great, except the data's wrong. You know, the, the results are wrong. And again, it came back and said, oh, so sorry. Um, I miscalculated your custom year. Uh, here's the correct code. And it gave me this really awesomely concise, you know, SQL query, which I ran and it was perfect. All the data was correct. And I, I implemented it in my little, little website that I keep. Um, that revealed a couple things to me. One is that I really don't fundamentally understand what's going on under the hood, if you will, um, with ChatGPT. Because the, the idea that it could create syntactically incorrect code well, the syntax was correct in the first case, but the scoping rules were violated. Um, and then be able to fix it. I, I don't really get how that all works. And I'm not sure, maybe nobody does, but I, I certainly don't. But it's super, super interesting. Um, and then the other thing I was reflecting on is that if, the, if I hadn't known what the data, what the, what the values were supposed to be, um, I would have accepted the, that second query. I would have said, oh yeah, that looks great. Only all my results would be wrong. But but I did know what the values were going to be. And now I have this awesomely concise, you know, really beautifully written query that is better than I would have written. And it, the whole process only took like seven minutes. And it would have taken me a lot longer than that because I'm not very familiar with SQL. I have to kind of look things up again every time I do it because I only like use it once a year. So it really showed me this incredible power of AI working with people to do amazing things. You know, the, the productivity increase, I think, could be really profound. So I think now I'm old enough to have lived through the dot-com you know, boom and bust cycle that we had here in Silicon Valley. And as a VC, as you might imagine, every company we see is somehow dot AI. It's just like it was in 2000 with dot-com. And you know, that time is super exciting and lots of money goes into like the dot-com world or now the AI world. Uh, and last time when eventually it blew up, uh, there were pundits that said, ah, you see that whole Silicon Valley hype machine, you know, the internet, it's stupid. No one's gonna really use it. It just is smoke and mirrors from Silicon Valley. And of course, that was the beginning of the internet changing everything that we do. And I think we're in kind of a similar moment right now with AI that, you know, when we look back Mark, at, you know, you some point, yeah. Yeah, do you have, I, I know I didn't ask you this ahead of time, but do you have any interesting props to prove that you're not an AI and that you really did work on this project? <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, no, not really. Uh, I have a, I have a uh, here, I have a SpaceX pin that Elon gave me, and it's a little rocket. Yeah, okay, but, but nothing, you don't have like a model, the Roadster there, or, do you have a roadster oh. in your garage? Uh, let's see. What do I I've have? I've been to your house. I, yeah, I know. Here's a, here's a Model S plastic, you know, really early uh, idea of what it's going to look like. Yeah. And um, are you surprised at the vector of the company, or it's what you expected? Oh, it's, 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 it's what we dreamed of. You know, and maybe Elon is an AI. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, he seems real when he's there. On balance, have your interactions with Elon been strange or normal or underwhelming? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so Elon is quite a character. And I haven't, I, you know, admit I haven't seen, well, I certainly haven't seen him since he took over Twitter. Um, Would you have but, advised him against that? Uh, I don't, I'm not a big Twitter user, so I, you know, it seemed like a pretty expensive purchase to me. Okay. But. All right. So um, are you glad, so you're Silicon Valley 
we want to, you know, St. Louis was Silicon Valley before Silicon Valley. Detroit was Silicon Valley before Silicon Valley. 128 was Silicon Valley before Silicon Valley. Right. Mike Stonebreaker made, got the Turing Prize. He made the database and then Oracle and Silicon Valley like exploited it. You know, he's an MIT guy. I'm getting all these people together because I think this could be a, an incredibly dynamic space for AI, uh, the talent pool here on the East Coast. Do you think it's a fool's errand? Are you glad we're doing it? Or do you want to uh, try to disrupt us? What, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I, no, I, I actually think that the flow between Silicon Valley and, and Boston and the whole ecosystem there is super important. And I, I don't think, you know, the AI is going to change everything. I mean, it already is beginning to, but it's going to be, this is, this is like the internet, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, this is just, okay, it, let me it's not there. Gonna, who can now say they heard from the co-founder of Tesla? Okay. All right. Who, who, who found that rewarding? Okay, who found it underwhelming? Okay, all right. Mark is amazing. Mark, hey, thank you so much for that.